Uh, my name's Ross, I'm a fourth year philosophy student, uh, which basically means I solve puzzles for, uh, for my degree. We're going to try and solve a lot of puzzles today. All right, so I'm going to start by asking you to consider a question. How do you use your emotions in your research? No, I hear you cry. I absolutely don't. <laughs> research consists in pure rationality, you know, in cold hard facts and logic and mathematical proofs. You might even say that your rationali the rationality you employ in your research is simply defined as being bereft of those pesky meddling emotions. Well, let's see if I might dissuade you of this notion. For my talk today, I intend to demonstrate how emotions are not the enemy of reason, as might be your first impression, but in fact are an essential tool in a rational decision-making process. By the end of this 10 minutes, I hope you'll be able to see that in order that we may understand our own reasoning, we must first understand our emotional lives. <sighs> now, forgot what's in the slides. Now, this might seem a little bit preposterous to some of you. So let's start with the basics. As I'm trying to convince you that emotions are essential for rationality, why don't we try and define a common sense understanding of rationality? What steps must we take in order, uh, when faced with the decision in order that we can assure the result we get is rational? Well, this is the traditional model of rational decision making we're going to go through. Step one, we identify that a decision needs to be made. That's pretty self-explanatory. Step two, we need to know what our options are. We need to consider the options we have available to us when making this decision. This so that in step three, we can evaluate our options. We can perform a cost-benefit analysis, list the pros and the cons, and then we can act on the option with the highest value. I hope that sounds vaguely reasonable to everyone. Uh, if it doesn't, I apologize. Uh, but that is the traditional model of uh, rational decision making and has been for a long time. It makes a lot of sense. It appeals to how we feel we're acting when we're making a rational decision. We list our options, we weigh them up, and we act on the one that makes the most sense. So what was all that emotions rubbish at the start? Well, let's see. Let's apply our traditional model of rational decision making to an everyday decision we might have to make. So step one, what should I do with my neck? My first option is I could go for a sleep. It's been two wonderful days at conference and I need to be up early. I need to get to the library, need to get back to work on the dissertation. Or I could go and study now after the conference is done, could go get some work done at the library. These are kind of generally the options that I have. I could go and get a bit of work done, then still get there early night, get back to the dissertation. All relatively reasonable options, but I don't think we're done yet. I could go out to a bar for a nice refreshing glass of orange juice. I could go out for a walk or to a music show or a poetry show. I could draft a withdrawal letter from university. I could run off and join the circus. I could watch eight hours of American TV at a fancy restaurant and with, with the express intention of running out on the bill. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And I hope you can see a little bit of a problem here with the rational decision making model that we started with. So. Step two in the traditional model insists that we consider the options available to us when making a rational decision. But when we think about it, when we put step two into practice, there are way too many options for us to ever consider them all. How do we choose which options that we consider and which ones we disregard straight away? We'd be forever simply listing off plans that I could make for the night and we'd never get to step three or step four. So given that we do make decisions and that we consider at least some of those decisions to be rational, we need an explanation. Hey, we've got something missing. So while you have a wee think about what that, decision, what that extra little step can be, I want to give you two conditions that that, condition, that, that uh, criteria must meet. Uh, the first is that any step we add into this process must be non-arbitrary. What I mean by this is that for a fully rational decision-making process, we cannot let any step be left up to chance or luck. A common answer to the question is that we, imply some, we employ some sort of mental heuristic. 
you know, I will consider the first 10 options and those are likely to be the best ones. Or I will use the options that are closest to my most recent behavior. Now this is a uh, heuristic by definition is non-exact and therefore doesn't fit into a fully rational model of decision making. So we can disregard any measure which is, non, which is arbitrary. Second feature is the component itself must not involve a decision. Another common answer to the problem uh, I've described is to impose a time limit on how long you ought to consider your options. Now this isn't arbitrary in that the more time we have to make a decision or the harder the decision is to make, we spend more time considering the decision. So it's not arbitrary, it makes a lot of sense rationally. However, it involves a decision. How long do we spend considering each decision? So that's just taking the problem one step back, because you have to make a decision before your decision and you end up all the way back at the start. So we have two criteria that our new step needs to take. It can't be arbitrary and it can't involve a decision. And here we go. It's been a long time coming, but I'm getting to the point. I told you to start with, here it is. I believe the solution and the missing step in our rational decision-making process are our emotions. There they are, all four of them. When we try to make a rational decision, when we list off our options, we feel instinctively that some make more sense than others. And the ridiculous ones never even bother our conscious minds. So when I actually make a decision what I ought, of what I ought to do tonight, I won't even consider running away to join the circus because it doesn't make any sense. I don't feel like that is a good option in any sense whatsoever. And feel is the right term for that. I might consider watching eight hours of American TV because let's be honest, that feels good anytime. So not only do I feel this rings true with what we can, how we feel when we consider our options, but it fits into our two criteria as well. Our feelings aren't arbitrary. We understand them as rational and irrational. And they definitely don't involve a decision. We don't choose how we feel. So with this in mind, I'm going to ask you the question again. How do you use your emotions in your research? Well, if you want to say your research is based on pure rationality, I hope by now you can see you use your emotions in every decision you make when coming up with your research and carrying it out. This being the case, if we wish to understand our rationali the rationality we use every day in our research, we must also endeavor to understand our emotional lives, which is an integral part of that research. It's also my research, personally. My research is to look into the rationality and the authenticity of our emotions. And the more we understand about this, the more we can understand about our research in general and at large. So this is why I think we ought to spend more time talking about emotions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, any questions? Pardon? The fourth step in your model was act on the option with highest value. Is that correct? It is, yeah. Okay, so when you say value, do you mean financial value, moral value, future value, present value, or emotional value? So that is a very good question. Thanks very much. In the model, value can stand for whatever you hold valuable. So. I tend to think there is an objective answer to that question. I think that there is a value that we should strive for when we're looking at rationality. But seeing as I don't have a model to give you for that, plug in whatever value you find important, whether it's the consequences of your actions, the morality involved, the finance, the progression, the you know, intellectual stimulation, whatever value you want, you can plug into that system. I'm sure there are, but <laughs> no, um, personally, I think that any other option, um, the main two options that oppose the emotion view are the mental heuristic and the time-based one. And as I say, I think the criteria that we need to look at in order to find our missing step 
would negate both of those. So the main answers that people give is we assign a time limit to the amount of, t uh, the amount of time we spend reasoning. I think that's wrong uh, because it involves a decision. And uh, mental heuristic was the other, is the other one that comes up frequently. And I think that's arbitrary because of the, the inexactitude of uh, heuristics. So as you saw earlier, I'm a scientist. <laughs> I was waiting for this question. <laughs> and one of the things that Andrew and I spoke about when we were planning all of this was that it, last year what struck me was seeing the way that other people do things and instinctively going, no, I don't do that, or, or, or that's a really silly way of doing it because you need controls in your experiments. <laughs> and it took me a while to accept that you just need to appreciate other people because <laughs> fields have different methods in their <laughs> 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 uh, So my question is, have you taken, have you had any conversations with people um, to persuade them that they, they actually are more emotional and, and how, what is your response from other scientists and do you think there ever is a situation where they can be completely, completely objective? Well, I think that emotions can be objectively rational. So I, like, I understand, I think if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, you're kind of, you're kind of making this distinction between kind of head and heart is that the head is rational and objective, and if you're using your emotions, your heart, you're kind of in some way less than that, or you're, you're, you're being subjective, you're applying values that don't matter rationally. I personally disagree with that. I think your emotions can be rational. We describe certain emotions as rational and irrational. When you cry at your favorite TV character's death, I, that might be rational, but we think that's an irrational, cry when you are scared of a house spider in Scotland, you know not to be dangerous, that's an irrational fear. So we understand emotions as rational and irrational. All we're looking for in our rational decision making process is to have rational emotions plugged in uh, to the system. I think you have just helped me win every argument I Um, sorry, um, I'm just wondering, is this a model that only works within a framework of what you're ascribing as normal mental health? And how would that, and I'm saying normal kind of because yeah, yeah. it's problematic. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, we generally, uh, when, in the study of emotions, we separate emotional, uh, emotional life into three different sections. So, so we have kind of instinctual reactions, uh, which are kind of like surprise and things like that, you know, things that you just kind of happen to you that are technically emotions. And then you have kind of uh, emotional, I'm trying to remember the word, like states where you, you feel happy for a while or you feel sad for a while. Then you have, thirdly, um, emotional dispositions. Now, in the way of emotional mental health, there is a problem with dis dispositions. Some people think, Personally, I have a little bit of a problem with the ideas uh, as they stand within the um, framework of uh, the philosophy of emotions. Um, but I feel like that is an issue for that third kind of time. What we're talking about is kind of more the first and second. So it wouldn't necessarily, it could impact on your rationality. And I think we could, we could see that it has an impact, but I don't think it would preclude you from being rational necessarily or exactly how I feel about it in general, yeah. Um, obviously, within analytical philosophy uh, and in logic, um, like emotional fallacies would be seen to be rhetorical. So I'm just wondering how you would consolidate what you're talking about with a larger kind of analytical framework or, or with logic. Um, well, it's a big question. <laughs> No, that's fine. Um, so I think I'm going to give a largely similar answer to the one I gave to Scott, is that, um, I mean, this seems to be the most intuitive answer that we have to the problem of rationality. If I were to put those, you know, those steps up in a logical form, in an analytical form, uh, I would probably be able to give you not a fully valid and sound argument, but I'd be able to give you a very intuitive answer 
Yeah, I think the, the, it does come down to the fact that kind of uh, trying to think of something slightly more interesting to say than just repeating kind of my answer over here. But I think that is the, is the, the emotions, I feel, are as rational as the beliefs, the desires, any other mental state. Okay. Okay. So we say, oh, sorry, there you go. Yeah. So is rationality the, the rationality like something subjective to your emotions? Or how do you be like have an objective thing when it's rational? And how would you decide kind of like, that question of mental health? What is rational? We're saying that some mental health is rational in some way. So what would not? No, thank you for that. Uh, I do believe there is an objective rationality. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily the normal rationality, so I don't think it's necessarily what we consider normal. We consider a lot of things to be normal, but if we looked at them a little closer, as we've seen in our talks today and, uh, and yesterday, where people say like, here's this thing you think is like normal and fine, and then they show you how kind of wrong you are about that, or why we need to look further into it. It's a lot of amazing stuff that's been going on in this conference shows that. So I don't think necessarily a rationality should be based on what's normal. However, I do believe there is an objective rationality about what is right and wrong, and emotions fit into that framework as well. Okay, cool. Thank you very much, Ross. Thanks.